Open Your Eyes is brought to you by the Belize Bank, our country, your bank. Start your morning right. I'm Marlene Cuellar. And I'm Gavin Courtney. And thank you for joining us this morning. It's almost Friday. That's right. <laughs> and we had a bit of showers to wash off the city overnight. And so far it seems to be a dry day. It's a big day in Belize City. Yep. And the weather will be important. We have Michael Gentle on the line to tell us more. Good morning. Yes, good morning. How are you today? I'm doing okay. All right, so I was just saying that we got some showers last night. I don't know what that means for the rest of the day. Yeah, we, uh, we expect general fair conditions for most areas, except that we can expect a few showers for the southern half of the country. Okay. And uh, the winds? The winds will be uh, from the east and northeast at 10 to 20 knots, and this will produce choppy sea conditions. Okay. And, uh, or high temperatures for today? Okay, we're expecting 86 along the coast, 90 inland and 80 in the hills. Mm -hmm. And for tonight, 78 along the coast, 72 for inland areas, and 68 for the high elevations. Okay. And our extended forecast to close off the week? Okay, we are expecting conditions to continue generally fair with isolated showers uh, during Friday, however, mm -hmm. A cold front is up, will approach the country Friday night, and we can expect a few showers or uh, periods of rain uh, as it approaches Friday night and crosses the country early Saturday. Oh, you give that good news so bareface. <laughs> We're excited yeah. to hear about cold fronts. Is it going to be cooler or more rain? Um, no, it, the front will uh, move through um, quite rapidly. We expect um, by Saturday we should see conditions starting to dry out and it will um, be cool for Saturday and Sunday but starts warming up again by Monday. All right. And as you said for today, because we know we have a, a protest planned in the city, it should just be sunny with cloudy spells. Cloudy spells, yeah. We expect some uh, few showers will pass uh, to the south. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for that update. Okay, welcome. You have a great day. Okay. There you have it. That's the type of weather update I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> what? The sunny skies? Both. On the cold front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a and an, uh, cold front coming over this weekend. For today, at least, we are going to see uh, sunny skies with some clouds, and that wind continues. All right, we're going to keep things moving this morning, and we're going to get into a bit of motivation, and that means it's time for our eye opener. And our eye opener, taken from dailyom.com, goes like this. Make sure you aren't running away from your problems, always moving towards something. There are times when change, moving to a new city or a new home or changing careers, is the right thing at the right time. But there are also times when the urge for change is really just a desire to run away from problems that need to be faced rather than avoided. These are the kinds of problems that recur in our lives. For example, Issues with co-workers that seem to arise at every job we take or repeatedly getting into unhealthy relationships. A move might temporarily distract us and even cure the problem for a time, simply by taking us out of the situation in which the problem fully manifested itself. However, the problem will eventually appear again in our new situation. You may discover that as you address these issues, you're able to make more money simply by changing your mindset. You may still decide to move, but it will be an act with a positive intention behind it and not an escape, which could make all the difference. Any pain involved in facing our issues is well worth the effort in the end. When we face our problems, instead of avoiding them, we free our energy and transform ourselves from people who run away 
into people who move enthusiastically forward. Mm. Pretty powerful message. Yeah. It's definitely one of the most difficult things for us to do really to face our problems head on. Yeah. A lot of people actually think that running away from them is a way of facing them because if they're experiencing something difficult or something super challenging, whether it's at work or at home, they think, well, rather than letting me, you know, confront this head on, let me, yeah. you know, not deal with it, let me root away, pretend that it doesn't exist. Yeah. And um, a lot of the times, as um, our eye opener did say, it, the issues do tend to resurface later on, yeah. especially if it's something personal. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a huge benefit in, you know, gathering yourself, um, focusing on whatever the problem is, and then really trying to tackle it head on to, you know, deal with it. Yeah. You know, I think it helps if you pay keen attention to the things you say to yourself. You know, if you're complaining to uh, friends, family, coworkers, whoever it is, about the same problems in different situations, then you are just kind of changing your environment but not really addressing the issue that you have. And, you know, it's easier to run away. It's easier to change the scenery. Um, it's easier to just say, okay, I don't want to deal with it, uh, so I'll change my job, I'll, I'll leave my relationship, leave my marriage, leave uh, whatever circumstance is just extremely difficult. But you're not necessarily going to be guaranteed to find anything better or to change the situation that you found yourself in. And I love what the eye opener specifically states when it says, you run away from the problem when it manifests itself. So in other words, it starts a long time before and then when it really reaches a breaking point, that's when we want to skid out a lot of the place. And it can be in any part of our lives. That's what I'm, I'm really thinking this morning. I think of the protest that's coming up. I think of um, problems that we see within our society and thinking of how much I've heard people just say, man, I just want to get out of this country. I want to um, move and, and get a job somewhere else or, or not have to deal with it anymore. But it doesn't necessarily fix it. And it's no different with uh, your personal relationships. It's no different with the feelings you have in your job. Uh, we have to hunker down and we have to address the problem because running away from it just, it, it's not like you can be an ostrich and stick your head in the mm -hmm. sand and think it'll go away. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the first thought that came to me this morning. For sure. And I also think that as we usually say, um, Another part of addressing your problems can um, be also as easy as asking for help. Yeah. You know, if you want to talk to somebody, um, whether it's, you know, if it's a work-related problem, if it's somebody superior, whether it's somebody who has more experience or who has been through something the same yeah. way, same thing goes for family. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times that when we're experiencing a, um, an issue, running away seems like a good time or, and especially if we're super emotional about yeah. the issue we don't want to deal with it and if it's yeah. if it's something that's really painful then it can be really hard to address yeah that's why um when you do have um you know tell your problem to a listening ear especially if they're not involved in the situation so they have a more objective point of view yeah it can be definitely a whole it really helpful in um, solving whatever issue you have or giving you advice um, or even just supporting you, making you feel comfortable in addressing um, whatever change needs to be made. So there's definitely a lot of value in reaching out to others um, to help you through whatever situation it is that you're going through. That's right. And don't be scared of having the difficult conversations or tackling that problem head on. Better you deal with this one rather than have to come up on it <laughs> soon and in, in the near future. Oh, yeah. And of course, habits are hard to change the more we do them. So <laughs> if you don't address whatever is a recurring issue in your life, yeah. it tends to, it's going to get um, harder to, you know, change the, the further down the road. That's absolutely right. So that's an eye opener. I think we can all learn a bit from this morning. But of course, we got to get moving into a show. And uh, before we do, though, there's a lot happening today, as I said uh, earlier on. Today, the unions are taking to the streets in protest. Uh, we do want to remind our viewers this morning that we will be having uh, live coverage from the rally, um, from the protest today. Uh, they'll be moving from, uh, Mem from Constitution Park to Memorial Park and they'll close off with a rally. Um, the uh, protest is being organized by the National Trade Union Congress of Belize. Uh, other unions have, in fact, joined in. We saw the PSU, the BNTU, 
There are a lot of other unions. I, I don't want to list them and forget anyone. Um, but we also saw the National Student Union joining in, which I think is really critical, our young people uh, getting engaged. And it's, it's to be seen uh, what will be said today, um, what type of support they'll have, and also looking at uh, what comes from it. Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to be um, a situation to watch. Um, we know that there's definitely been a lot of national issues that have been in the forefront of everybody's mind for yeah. the past um, you know, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, it's sort of culminating in this movement. And I think a lot of people are advocating for change, um, yeah. implementation of new measures to you know, improve some of the problems in our society. Yeah. And it's, of course, not the first time that people have taken to the streets in protest, mm -mm. Um, especially on this scale. Yeah. So it's definitely um, going to be interesting to watch what happens today. I'm expecting um, that there's going to be a whole lot of um, different perspectives, different views shared. And I hope that, um, you know, that today goes through, you know, peacefully, that everybody's yeah. um, safe and that there's no issues. Um, so I'll definitely be watching um, and keeping yeah. up with the um, events that as they unfold today. Yeah. You know, it, it isn't, um, you said it right, it's not the first time we see protests, but protests aren't as common in Belize um, as you would see in other parts of the world. Usually when people get upset over anything, they'd, mm -hmm. they'd stage a protest. We don't see it very often and we don't usually see the unions amalgamating like this. Um, there are only a few instances that I can think of um, in the recent past uh, that uh, I can recall them all coming together. The BNTU has taken a stance on its own. Um, we've definitely seen that one and they're going to be joining in today. I think one of the interesting things that took place yesterday was the Ministry of Education approving a non-school day mm -hmm. uh, for, for the protest. So the kids aren't going to school today. Um, that's a good cue for you if you have if you were anticipating traffic. <laughs> uh, but if you are going to go around the Constitution Park area, that area by the um, by the bus station, then you you do want to take that into consideration because there should be a lot of movement happening there. And let's remember too that this is all hinged on six demands coming out from the union. Uh, they have listed a number of things. Uh, number one on that list is looking at campaign finance, finance legislation. They're also talking about rolling out or, well, what they're really saying is that they want to reconvene the meetings uh, for UNCAC. As we learned last year, as early as December, um, it had not been since February of 2018 since they had had a meeting uh, with the different stakeholders to look at moving forward with the implementation of UNCAC. Um, the NTUCB had joined us, I think, in February, in January, um, to talk about the very same issue. And now it seems that they are adding that to their list of demands, that they can't get things moving when it comes to rolling out UNCAC. And when we have the primary issue um, that people are talking about and thinking about, about is corruption, it, it shows why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it sends a strong message that the unions and people are actually mobilizing for yeah. the implementation. Because I think um, perhaps there's a sense that, um, you know, the government, um, and it's not, you know, related to uh, necessarily to a political party. It's just that the, the nature and operation of government needs um, a bit more oversight yeah. and more accountability, more accounting. Mm -hmm. um, so the message is definitely getting delivered today and um, apart from hoping that everything goes smoothly, I hope that the response uh, yeah. to the message is also, um, you know, pretty strong as well. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's why I think it, it is a big deal because as I said earlier, and I can keep on reinforcing it, we don't see these types of movements um, very often. Um, and I think for me, I was really excited to see the National Student Union chiming in. Um, one of the things that we know is, 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 is important is when the younger generation can be able to recognize that what's happening right now has very serious implications on their own future. Um, the National Student Union, I think, was formed maybe about two years ago. I could be off with my timing, a year or two years ago. And it's uh, tertiary level students from different um, institutions across the country coming together to form their own union. They've issued a few releases, but I think joining in on, and it's a good experience. You know, when you're young, you have that 
energy and vibrancy and, and you have a lot more idealism as to what can possibly take place. And I think we do have to capitalize on that. Yeah, I think if anything, um, you know, what you said is, is definitely true. And I think it also shows that in general, at all levels of society, people are um, maybe kind of tired of the status quo, yeah. um, at least as it relates to how, you know, m public monies are spent yeah. um, and especially um, what actually is going into, you know, financing, you know, political campaigns yeah. um, and then other initiatives um, of the government um, or, or of government officials um, because they are, not, they are not always one and the same. So um, once, uh, you know, if they do achieve their objectives, it could be definitely something that would be radical, a radical departure from what we're used to yeah. in Belize. We're used to asking, you know, a lot of questions as to, you know, how did this come about or what, which money was spent or where did money yeah. come from to spend on these um, projects or whatever initiatives have been planned. Um, so I think that if there is greater accountability or if there is at least a shift in yeah. the way that we monitor these things um, and all sorts of transactions, then it can get definitely um, bring about um, a big change and for the better in my view. And you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I failed to, to say that one of the demands also includes the investigation into the Saldiva scandal. Because interestingly enough, since the resignation of uh, Honorable Saldiva from the cabinet and uh, from the post of party leader, we haven't heard much follow up as to whether or not there will still be an investigation um, and what will take place uh, after all the information has been revealed from Utah. The, the very first word we'd heard from the Prime Minister um, before uh, Saldiva's resignation from the Cabinet was that there would be an investigation. Whether or not that is still continuing, um, whether they've accessed the information from the U.S. government or the U.S. courts to be able to find out more about what's going on, we haven't heard anything from. And I think that's the frustration that people feel, that it's just a lot of lip service that you mm -hmm. get and very little action and a whole lot of apologists that come out on television and you know spin things skew things that go against the logic and common sense of everyday Belizeans and, and then people are tired of it. Absolutely um, I think that's definitely a big area I think whenever there's lots whenever there's political scandals um, we often kind of lose track just because something else may happen tomorrow and it may not even be related. It could be so whatever gets um, people's attention going. Mm -hmm. People suddenly forget about um, whatever the big issue may have been yesterday or the day before. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and you know, not also acknowledging that whatever was the political scandal or whatever usually has very um, far-reaching implications, yeah. very long-lasting implications. And so when uh, people feel sort of hopeless that there is going to be actual follow-up, when there's a situation yeah. where there seems to have been wrongdoing, yeah. uh, then um, it can be somewhat demoralizing. So to me, it's rather encouraging that people are actually getting out today, moving and, you know, fighting for accountability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and their theme is only the people can save the people. I do quite appreciate that one because we... We seem to have lost sight of the people power that we do possess. Now, I have to be honest, one of the things I've paid attention to is today is a one-day protest, um, and it's a one-day demonstration to, to show uh, their discontent with the situation. If we recall the last time this took place, um, when the teachers' union had their list of demands, a BNTU, when they took to the streets, it was every single day until those demands were met. And it didn't happen in one day or two days. I think it was eight days, mm -hmm. if I remember right. 11. Mm -hmm. 11 days for eight demands. That's, yes. that's the numbers mm -hmm. I'm mixing up. Um, so that's how long it took for uh, there to be su uh, sufficient um, force for any action to take place. And they had all their demands met as well. So that's, that's kind of what, when I'm looking at today, I hope that's not the case. I hope that uh, the, the government, I hope that um, everyone who is paying attention will be able to look at today's protest and hopefully we don't have to continue day after day uh, to really get any, any type of movement. I don't know how much the government will be paying attention. They have a pretty big meeting taking place in Bamapan today as well. Interestingly timed, I must say, 
Um, so they'll be meeting to try to figure out their internal party politics as to how they'll move forward with the leadership. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's definitely um, more important when we think about it in the context that this is an election year. Yeah. So definitely, I think that the, you know, both um, the government is definitely going to be watching. We mm. also know that the opposition is planning its own protest this weekend. That's right. Um, a lot of these issues, you know, of course, they're political. But, um, you know, as I said before, people are feeling uh, the implications of whatever actions or the build up, I should say, of actions over the years. Yeah. And I think that that growing sense of frustration really is going to be um, something that either political party, and I shouldn't say either, I should say any, because mm -hmm. we, we do have more than two, um, should mm -hmm. really um, be paying attention to what uh, the people on the ground are saying mm -hmm. and take it into account looking forward um, if it is that they do have the country's best interests at heart they'll be listening to what um, occurs today and taking it into account to see if they can actually implement what it is that the people want yeah. um, for the future and for the country yeah you know yesterday to the the international um trade union congress and and i thought it was really interesting that they they commented on the belizean situation they issued a release to show their support for the NTUCB, but they said something that I thought resonated with me personally because I really have been paying attention to what's been taking place in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. It's a bit inspiring. It's always inspiring for me when I see people acknowledging their power and making use of it. Um, and so it is said, the message states that uh, all across the world, people are losing faith in governments and political systems due to the failure of politicians to govern for the people and the all too frequent capture of policy making by moneyed interests. And, you know, I, I think it just perfectly sums up what we have been seeing in other parts of the world, what we're feeling here today. And as I said, we'll, we'll show you what's taking place. We'll provide those updates for you. Those will be on Channel 5 Live. They will also be uh, streamed on our Facebook page as well. So you can look out for that. Yeah, for sure. All right, so we got to get moving into our show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today we're having a conversation about something else. It's a pretty hot topic. It's um, the Equal Opportunities Bill. So they went through the consultations, they closed off their period for review, and now they have their new amendments that they're discussing and they're trying to uh, get the word out about. We know that there have been quite a few, um, a, a couple of uh, groups from the churches specifically that have spoken out against the Equal Opportunities Bill and certain sections of it. And so we're going to tackle uh, that conversation as the first part of our show. Yeah, and for our second conversation, we are going to be talking about the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People report on uh, the state of Belize's Barrier Reef. Or um, there was, of course, a study done on the entire Mesoamerican reef system, yeah. and we are um, getting an update on what Belize's report card was. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that if you um, were following the story, we um, actually did get a pretty good grade. So we are going to be discussing a bit of the details that came out in uh, the report that um, did come out on the reef, and I'm telling you all about that. All right, and we are closing off. There are always good things happening in the country, too. We do have to remember that. There's small community organizations that are working really hard to improve the lives of people. One of those programs is the Rising Stars Sports Development Program in Belmopan. And so we're going to have uh, some of the representatives here to talk about uh, what they're doing, why they're doing it, how many people they've impacted, and if you're in that particular area, how you can be a part of it as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's definitely going to be a fun show. Uh-huh. So we're going to go ahead and take that break. And when we come back, we'll get our conversation started. So please stay tuned. The Belize Bank introduces its mortgage loan promotion for first-time homeowners. Offering...
And we're back and we're getting ready to move into a conversation for this morning. We're focusing on the Equal Opportunities Bill, but more importantly, the recent amendments that have been included uh, in the draft. We have with us on set Rashid Brathwaite, Rashad, Brathwaite, Rashad yeah. sorry, Brathwaite, Brathwaite yeah. who is the consultant who's preparing the bill. And we also have Enrique Romero, who's the executive director for the National AIDS Commission. Good morning, Good morning. and welcome. Good morning, and thanks for having us. Good yeah. morning. It's yes, and uh, coming with updates. That's what's most important. Uh, updates and explanations. Um, some of it are some of the uh, proposed changes. Those have to go to the committee for yeah. review. Um, and but some of it, I think there's still a, a fair bit that can be explained. Yeah. Um, and so we're happy to hear be here to provide that. Yeah. You know, Enrique, if I could just uh, get you into the conversation sure. early, I think. It was interesting to, to know, and I think many, many people haven't really paid attention mm -hmm. to the fact, that the National AIDS Commission is the agency that has taken the lead on this. In other words, this came out of the brainstorming there in your own office. That's, Tell, go ahead. So, yeah, that's correct. Um, and I, as we have been mentioning uh, to the public at large, the National AIDS Commission, as part of its mandate, has the responsibility for resource mobilization advocacy and the development of policy and legislation. Mm -hmm. So through our work uh, over the past 20 years, you know, through um, participation at regional um, forums and uh, sending out the treaties and conventions, we felt that it was now we have reached a point now that we had to move from advocacy into action. Mm -hmm. um, through our membership on the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV and its PANCAM, mm -hmm. you know, every year there's discussions on how to move forward in terms of making a significant impact on the epidemic, on the AIDS epidemic. And we have several studies that have been done under the auspices of the National AIDS Commission. And all, all of these are pointing to the fact that in order for us to make significant strides in the AIDS epidemic, it has to be through legislative reform. Um, significant investments have been made in HIV and AIDS through funding from the Global Fund, regional partners, and counterpart funding from the government. But yet today we still see an increase in new infections. 2018 we saw 254 new infections. When globally the infections in, in adults is decreasing, yeah. but believe we see an increasing trend. So we say it necessary to, to, to enforce our mandate and look mm -hmm. at now at moving from advocacy into action. In Belize, similar to the Caribbean, is seeing rising yes. numbers, um, mm -hmm. while everywhere else they're get, kind of getting it under That's control. Yeah. But, but tell me how you identified uh, discrimination as being one of the prohibitive factors in being able to reduce the numbers as we're seeing in other parts of the world. That's correct. As I mentioned, um, several studies have been done under the auspices of the NAC. Uh, I can speak to some of them. For example, we had the study to uh, barriers to early testing and adherence. And, and again, there are several factors that contribute to, to people not wanting to test early, people not adhering to medication. Yeah. But the bottom line, the, the significant barrier is the issue of discrimination. For example, uh, some pe persons were saying that they don't want to go to a public health facility to do a test because by the time they get out of the facility, the entire country knows that, you know, Enrique came to the hospital he went through a, a particular door, he saw a particular doctor, so he, something wrong with him, you know, mm -hmm. that, 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 um, things like those. And we have um, come across many stories yeah. of, of, it, of cases as those, no? And I appreciate you saying that, because we, we've discussed this quite yes. a few times mm -hmm. in, t in terms of being able to show the stories um, long before the Equal Opportunities Bill of what it's like to live with HIV. Right. And in fact, there have been serious challenges mm -hmm. in, in, in people having Dis to disclose uh, their status, uh, people who, uh, as of recent as last year, lost their jobs because mm -hmm. they did a media interview talking about why people should get tested. Right. And so, you know, it, it does, um, you have stories that highlight yes. that. But the next question then is, how did it go from a discrimination bill or an anti-discrimination bill, I'm sorry, for people living with HIV to such a broad spectrum right. of persons. Right, um, we started off, like I said, the CARICOM based uh, model bill that was developed in 2011, 2012. Uh, and again, PANCAP had been championship various, um, we have the Justice for All program, which seeks to um, look at eliminating um, discrimination, all forms of di discrimination in the region. And uh, like I said, as a commission, we subscribe to, to, to those um, to those initiatives. 
and we used the bill uh, as the basis for our, our Equal Opportunities Bill. And we felt that because of the, all the social factors, they are intertwined and they're all related, we felt that um, rather than just focusing on HIV and AIDS, we felt that gender-based violence was important, breastfeeding was important, sexual orientation was important. So th 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 there's a connectivity in all the 19 and maybe even more characteristics um, with HIV and AIDS, hence the reason why we thought that let's look at it um, in a bigger picture. You know? because all of these social factors do intertwine and interconnect. Yeah. And if we can jump in really quickly mm -hmm. here, um, when Belize last had its universal periodic review, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, one of the recommendations which was accepted by the government was the importance of passing comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. Um, and increasingly it's recognized that um, a comprehensive approach is, is what's necessary mm -hmm. rather than um, kind of siloed approaches where we address race in one piece of legislation, we address, um, for example, say sex in another piece of legislation, because firstly, um, there are then disparate regimes that um, employers and other service providers have to be familiar with, mm -hmm. which increases the compliance cost. Um, and then it, it misses that as humans, we exist within complex identities, mm -hmm. so that when an individual um, so, for example, you may have discrimination that could uniquely affect a woman who's of a particular ethnicity, but not a woman of another ethnicity or a man of that same ethnicity. So then the legislation also speaks to things like intersectionality, uh, because we, we live as complex human beings and those complexities, uh, they often form the basis on which people are discriminated against. Yeah. So we've, we've, talkin, we've, we've talked extensively about um, some of the elements of the bill. You had the consultations, you've heard the critics, you closed off the period at the end of January for mm -hmm. comments and for recommendations. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Uh, we're in, still in the process of meeting with key stakeholders and uh, reviewing some of those uh, concerns, um, the inputs into building this as a uh, piece of legislation that fits the Belizean context. Now, mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a, of necessity. That's both a conversation that is uh, delicate. It is one that is um, from, from multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. one that requires a, a great balancing exercise. And we've been um, very careful in attempting from the starting point, um, and now even as we continue with those um, stakeholder consultations, to think of what are the ways that um, some of these amendments can be incorporated uh, consistent with the state's obligations but also consistent um, with the, I think, the fabric of Belizean society. From the recommendations that you received, uh, tell me uh, what has been done with them so far. Um, well, I'm not in a position quite to say what ultimately makes its way into the bill. We're yeah. probably going to have an updated draft um, in the next two months or so that would be available for public comment. Um, but certainly we can start with some of the areas of concerns um, such as the burden of proof mm -hmm. um, and part of that I think was I think that's one that we can explain um, why it is necessary that um, there is a reverse burden of proof um, so and if you and if we can explain that just before you move into the explanation it means that the person who the allegation is against has to prove that they didn't discriminate right. versus so, the person who has been discriminated against having to prove that they were discriminated Not against. Quite. So I think that's one of the... Okay. So it first starts with the claimant always has to demonstrate uh, a prima facie case. You have to bring evidence that in the absence of an alternative explanation that discrimination did occur. Now the reason why um, an explanation would then need to come from the employer or the service provider is that uh, frequently, that knowledge is exclusively within the domain of the employer. So currently, in constitutional anti-discrimination cases, it is firstly, any, any discrimination case actually, um, firstly it is that the claimant establishes a prima facie mm -hmm. case and then it, the burden switches to the state. So in this case, it, it adopts that similar approach um, so that you may know, for example, that the employee was not compliant with a performance improvement plan. Mm -hmm. that there were X amount of disciplinary incidents before and that this is a justified termination. The employee, the employee wouldn't be in the position to possess that information. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's been recognized that uh, it's, a, it's a, a question of fairness of mm -hmm. what would allow the legislation to be 
effective um, while ensuring that both the employee and the employer, the duty holder, um, and the rights bearer, that they would um, be able to fairly make their case before the tribunal. So what, where do you think this misconception comes from? Um, I think that it is in the bill established, uh, it's, the, the caption is reversal of burden of proof, um, and it's in, in legalese, so it talks about a prima facie case. So for example, the UK Equality Act, the way that they explain it, um, might be a way that persons are more amenable to receiving it. So if I say that you have to prove all of this, and if there's no explanation, mm -hmm. um, then um, it, the burden switches. That sounds a little different than there's a reverse burden of proof and you have to prove your innocence. Yeah. Um, and then one of the other areas that uh, we have made amendments from the, the first set of consultations in January was the question of criminalization. Mm -hmm. uh, the bill as, has as its intent a civil framework. Um, and so almost all of the references with the exception of victimization uh, and contempt of court those uh, do not include any criminal provisions yeah. and the concern which means you won't go to jail for there's it. no jail you will most likely pay a fine or well actually let's talk about the remedies because yeah. the remedies are designed to address that discrimination is not just an individual question um, it's a question of, of systems so that some of the remedies include audits of policy so that an individual may have left a company um, and usually uh, the way that the court would address that is that if the individual has left the company, there's no need to address the company's policy uh, because it isn't a live fact before the court. But now, because we're addressing systemic discrimination, the court may say, well, perhaps we need to have an audit of policies to ensure um, that it's compliant with equal opportunity legislation. Um, mm -hmm. Other remedies include uh, you can have apologies, you can have uh, fines, you can have um, training so that their broad range of, of remedies and someone can be rehired someone can be rehired so that it goes further uh, it's not just a question of, of monetary it's a question of what is likely to result in systemic change mm -hmm. and I think um, you know since we're talking about remedies I think another one of the chief concerns among people who consulted is actually the functioning of the Commission and the tribunal yeah. themselves so has um, there been any um, f well what's the feedback been like um, in the consultations regarding uh, those provisions relating to those bodies? So I think that um, there has been a level of concern about the, the commission um, framed as an all-powerful commission and I think part of that um, is highlights the importance of separating the functions of the commission versus the tribunal. So the commission does not make any final de declaration. The commission doesn't address whether a respondent um, has acted unlawfully. The commission doesn't do any of that. The tribunal does. So one of the concerns, for example, was the question of funding. Um, the commission, like the mm -hmm. National AIDS Commission, the National AIDS Commission, in order to do its work, it has to access um, international technical funding. If the, com the Equal Opportunities Commission wanted to do a study on breastfeeding, so we talked about this previously, that Belize um, has a lower level of exclusive breastfeeding um, for the first six months than is ideal. Um, if the, the Commission wanted to do that work and it didn't have direct funding uh, coming from the National Assembly, it would be important that the Commission is able uh, to access funding. So that was an area of concern. Um, one of the areas that uh, I think we'll, we'll, we're relooking and assessing is the, the model of the Commission. Um, so that in some jurisdictions that the Commission has an investigative function, for others um, it has purely an alternative dispute resolution function. And so we're, we're having that assessment with the recognition, however, um, that where there is no Commission, um, equal opportunities or anti-discrimination legislation is terribly underutilized. So in the Caribbean, um, St. Lucia has an equal opportunities legislation, um, Trinidad and Guyana Suffice it to say that Trinidad is the only equal opportunities legislation that has been substantially used. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is kind of a, a global recognition that yeah. if you pass a legislation without effective institutions, um, then the, mm -hmm. the likelihood of its utilization is weak. And yeah. this is also then true if we take, for example, Belize has a lovely, lovely piece of legislation in the form of sexual harassment legislation. Um, but not terribly. It needs some work. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. does. You, you can tackle that next mm -hmm. if you'd like, yeah. but right. <laughs> that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. the, but what I hear from you is, is um, you want to come back to, the, to a public forum to discuss uh, clarifications of what exists in the bill. 
but the loudest cries have been from the churches and different sectors of yes. the churches. We've heard the Belize Council of Church churches um, saying that they agree with portions of the bill. Mm. They weren't very specific about what portions they didn't like, but they said that they felt after their legal consultation that there could be essentially some discriminatory practices back to them as the churches. Right. We've heard the evangelical groups coming out as well. Their main issue is the inclusion of the LGBT com um, community and also what they see as a, a, a misclarification with gender. Right. So let's, let's tackle those because yeah. that's really the <laughs> elephant in the <laughs> room. Right. Um, so let's start firstly with um, some of the concerns that stem around sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, I think after the, the court's rulings, um, it is clear that sexual orientation is a prohibited ground under the Constitution, and that is uh, kind of a, a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we've attempted to do, and I think it's an, an area of continued conversation, um, where the church, for example, may be directly involved um, in commerce and not just as a religious organization, mm -hmm. how do we address um, kind of religious convictions in, in service? And that's an area that we're working through. Uh, the exemption framework was first uh, supplied as a mechanism um, to allow for greater flexibility. But of course, one of the concerns is flexibility is not certainty. Um, and so that's an area that is actively under review. So that when the church, for example, has a guest house, um, how do we address that? In our, our public consultations, we've spoken to the intention to address where you have like a bed and breakfast that is um, owned and out of religious concerns, um, an individual may say, we only want to rent a double room to a married couple. And so we're looking to see how we can best incorporate those types of provisions uh, with the, the flip side of that being that you have to have notice. Yeah. So that even where there are permanent exemptions of those sorts, uh, and we're working through a range of those. But how does that work though? Because if I have a business and if I am Buddhist, I have a business that's that's it, it doesn't have anything to do with me being a Buddhist yeah. um, uh, and so that business should be regulated by what the business regulations geez. are very plainly right. so I guess my question uh, is how much accommodation can you make um, understanding that the church itself is its entity where people you know get together to pray they have their own organized organized hierarchy and whatnot but when they move from the church to business or schools, those are different groups. They yeah. have an association with those entities, but they're not ruled by the religious definitions they have. Yeah. Am I right? So it's, it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there But should is. it be that there should be a separation here in my mind, but I could be wrong. Right. So that in, in, some, in some aspects of business, so we're thinking of those personally, those closely held businesses like, like a, a bed and breakfast mm -hmm. uh, as one example. Um, and then thinking through the differences between um, services that are open to the public versus um, a service that, for example, catering, like making those differentiations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, it's, it's a, there are limits of accommodation. So for example, when we go back to um, the Maria Rocha's case, mm -hmm. um, there, there's a clear recognition that um, some obligations, um, that they are simply across the board and there is no getting around that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this, the, the bill will invariably have to reflect compromises, but recognition that uh, some compromises um, would otherwise but the, the Constitution um, and, and the state's obligations, yeah. So you have had a, a consultation with the Belize Council of Churches so far. How did that go? It was a productive discussion. Um, yeah. I won't go too much into it. Have they clearly the, defined where their issues are with the bill? Yes. And um, those were? Um, I think after we've kind of had our internal review, um, some of the and some of them were the general areas of concerns. For, so, for example, um, the church as an educational authority. Now, one of the limitations on this is that this is is to a large degree regulated by uh, the constitutional right to anti discrimination, etc. So that there are some limitations. Um, some of the other areas, for example, would be around tightening the provisions um, concerning marriage, just to show that out of an abundance of caution that um, it is fully addressed, that there is no 
scope for the legislation to be understood or utilized um, to other ways change the, the definition of, of marriage as has been recognized um, by the common law and implicitly within the Marriage Act. So some of those concerns are, are concerns that can um, be quickly onboarded. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really do want to highlight the uh, and, and thank the, the Council of Churches for uh, the specificity um, mm -hmm. of their feedback. And it, it's, a, it's something that um, we've asked for in, in our consultations for persons to be very clear about Section 12. Um, this is an area that we think lacks clarity, it's an area that we think mm -hmm. poses uh, particular challenges as opposed to um, a comprehensive rejection um, or we reject it in this form without specifying um, the particularities of the areas that we can then have a look at. Um, we started this process from uh, a perspective of genuine consultation and seeing how best can we ensure that this legislation um, balances the, the rights and concerns um, of all Belizeans. Um, and invariably, we've used this metaphor over the course of the last two months about the umbrellas, about if we're in a small confined space, how do we ensure that everyone both has an umbrella, but if we're in a close proximity of necessity, there's some accommodation, some jostling. Um, you also met with the Belize Chamber of Commerce, the private sector? We're going to be meeting with them on Friday. Okay. Mm -hmm. And who else have you met with? Uh, so we met with the association. The Belize Association of Principals of Secondary Schools as well. And their feedback? And again, they, they are a few of the groups that came with specific um, concerns and those were addressed by, by Rashad yesterday, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, of course, um, some concerns in the education sector. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that this legislation does not limit the ability of schools to ensure the safety? Um, of their students. Uh, some of the concerns um, I think we were able to address by way of information. So for example, um, where it is that um, there are concerns about a student being violent. Uh, mm. The legislation says that uh, it, a, a education authority shall not discriminate against a student by expelling that student, but you have to go back to the meaning of discriminate against. Mm. So firstly, you'd have to discriminate against the student, meaning to treat the student differently and less favorably on the basis of one of the protected characteristics for which there is no exception or exemption. So breaking the rules of the school um, isn't necessarily affected. It, it's more looking at Correct. some of the more common issues we've seen, whether a child has dreadlocks Correct, yeah. um, and mm -hmm. whether they should be forced to cut it or not, right. if, if they have it for religious reasons. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, mm. it is th th there, there is a time for us to reassess um, and this is a Caribbean-wide conversation um, about reassessing some of our school rules. So I attended an institution that um, was established in uh, the 18th century um, at home. And so many of our rules have developed out of colonial traditions, etc. Mm -hmm. and thinking through some of those. So where I think the constitutional discussion around here and freedom of expression um, has moved is that where the state is otherwise limiting or interfering with a person's expression of identity or religion, that the state has to give, have a good reason for doing that. So yeah. if there are legitimate safety concerns, um, then how can um, a school rule address that? How yeah. might that uh, be done in a way that is less restrictive than, for example, cutting hair? Might there be a way that um, I'm able to cover my hair? Or might it be that it's okay for me to wear my hair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You has, know, there, okay, yeah, has there been any feedback in relation to the actual uh, 19 characteristics that they do have? Especially, um, I think there was concern about the any other um, yeah, status. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so concerns sexual orientation, gender identity, um, any other status um, as a broad, flexible provision. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the justification for it, and it's an area that will be under review, is um, firstly, when we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, they all conclude with any other, an, an other status. Um, the any other status model that we've adopted is from the South African um, PAPUDA, uh, their anti-discrimination legislation. And what that does is that it, pro it provides a clear criteria of when um, the grounds could be expanded. But of course, um, uh, the, the key kind of concern that we've encountered is the distinction between flexibility and certainty. So, yeah, you give But also, beyond flexibility, though, because I've, I've heard some of the concerns where people have with this area, mm -hmm. and perhaps it's better if we just bring them forward. I think people, 
you know, the, the fear mongering um, has allowed for people to say things like, well, you know, pedophiles will right. apply under any other status. So, but my first response in terms of interpreting that question is that there are laws exactly. against that. Yeah. So where does one law supersede the other? That's where we have to oh, be right. able to. Uh, so let's talk quickly about any other status and then the yeah. relationship between laws. Um, so in order for another status to fall within the scope of the legislation, it must be that discrimination on that status causes or perpetuates a systemic disadvantage undermines human dignity or adversely affects equal enjoyment of a person's rights and freedoms in a comparable manner to the list um, that's provided. Um, and so that provides a clear criteria that excludes some of those um, concerns. Now, a big, big area of concern has been the question of the relationship between this law and other laws. And that's yes. an area that is actively under review mm -hmm. um, uh, to the extent that where there is a conflict um, if that provision does not exist within the legislation, yeah. uh, it could be challenged um, on the basis of the Equal Protection Clause mm -hmm. or um, other parts of the Constitution. And so that's an area that, uh, while I can't provide any guarantees, um, that we are actively reviewing uh, with a view to modification. You know, I, I'm trying to, to, to figure the best way to, to phrase this question because what we have in front of us is something that goes against what has been long established practices and adopted social norms. Yeah. Um, you know, you we were taught as children, we go to school, if they say go to church, you go to church. If they mm -hmm. say cut your hair, you cut your hair. If the workplace says don't, you don't. Um, and we kind of follow with these practices. What an equal opportunity bill, and, and you clearly stated that before, is kind of just bring us back up to speed with what does exist. I'll give you a clear example. Cat calling. Mm -hmm. Many times, people still in this room maybe still think that's okay. It's no longer acceptable. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. matter how long we've been doing mm -hmm. it, we don't like it, we don't deserve it, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. And when you try to challenge that, you are challenging decades of, of what has been um, a practice that's been accepted. Yeah. So how do you bridge that divide? Because it is a radical shift yeah. for some. Some people, I think, are, are more up to date and yeah. can be more accepting. But some clearly just want to hold on to what has been done for as long as possible yeah. because that's all they know. Yeah. Um, and, and this is the, the part of the... Um, process that is arguably the, the most difficult where we're then um, dealing with decades of traditions and people's strongly held emotions um, and feelings about that. Yeah. Um, I suppose my, my comfort here is that this is not the um, first time that the state will engage in an area that ch challenges um, long-held beliefs. So for example, um, when the when cohabiting unions were introduced and recognized in law when it was that status of children, um, children born outside of wedlock, when that was recognized. Many, when I look back at the historical record, uh, many of the concerns are, are terribly similar. Yeah. Um, and so in, in the first instance, the, the bill, um, if passed, there is a transitional phase. And so we're talking about phase implementation in the, in the context of the legislation. Um, so that it will take time for a commission to be established. Um, the, there are procedures for review um, included in the legislation and for, will be further strengthened in the bill. Um, and the commission will have to do a lot of work around education. And so it is important that um, why it is necessary to have institutions is that when sometimes it is simply that persons don't know, how do I address this new area? How do I address a student with a disability? Um, and how do I address in the workplace? Um, I've never had to. How do I, I know do this? And for example, around reasonable adjustments, there's some adjustments that are just a question of thought. How can I, what are the simple things that I can do? And we've attempted to be really pragmatic so that the legislation says, if there is anything um, that compliance will result in unjustifiable hardship, um, on a duty bearer, then you're not bound to do that under the legislation with clear criteria. Um, so that the commission has to do that work of education, um, 
-hmm. The legislation is built on a collaborative framework so that there's a framework for developing guidelines. And we, we know from um, other jurisdictions with equal opportunities legislations that equal opportunity legislation that when um, for example, the Ministry of Education, the Equal Opportunities Commission, um, educators, when they sit together, that they can come up uh, in a collaborative way with guidelines that are useful for um, institutions in um, modifying and uh, developing codes of conduct that would be useful and consistent. And I think it's also important to underscore that the bill actually is focusing on discrimination in public life. Yeah. Because I think that a lot of the concern arises out of the fact that, you know, people are saying things that is challenging my, yeah. you know, belief or the way I practice or I want to express myself. So, I don't know, perhaps for the viewers you might want to, I don't know, give a clear explanation of right. what exactly or how exactly the bill is supposed to function in relation to public life as defined. Um, right. And um, so there... You're spot on that um, persons' deeply held beliefs about the morality um, of some aspects of the bill, that's not in question. Um, persons remain free to believe and, importantly, to express um, those beliefs, uh, particularly where they're, they're located from within a religious frame. Mm -hmm. um, we've been very careful to ensure that that balance between the right not to be discriminated against and the right to freedom of religion and freedom of expression are protected. Yeah. Um, and so the legislation only covers uh, particular areas of public life. So for example, um, the bill doesn't in include and speak to, um, to, to benefits, to pensions, etc. And we'll, we'll, what we can do is, is make that clearer, um, but highlighting, I think, that persons remain free, um, ultimately, to um, make decisions for their own families. I remember when we were in, I think, in San Ignacio, um, one gentleman, he said, you know, I think that, um, I think women are naturally carers and nurturers mm -hmm. and that, um, that this legislation is changing that. And my simple response was, that's, if that's the arrangement that works for you and your family, then you remain free to live out that truth within um, your life. But the state also has to make provisions um, to ensure that um, women who want to, to do this work, that they're able to do it and that they're able to do it without discrimination. Or if the company has a position open that women have equal access Correct. to it as well. And not because equal you, pay. you like your uh, wife at home doesn't mean that the woman applying should be held to those That's same standards. Right, exactly. mm -hmm. There's a lot of good from it. And I, and I think perhaps that the greatest challenge that you have is overcoming um, the barrier that still exists in the acceptance of the LGBT community, mm -hmm. um, you, you said it very clearly in the beginning, the law has been repealed. The Section 53 um, law has been repealed. We've seen where that has not moved any further. It is now a matter of fact in this country. Will there be any accommodations for the inclusion of the LGBT community um, in the in the equal opportunities bill because that's the loudest cry uh but what will take place with that can you explain uh, accommodations in terms of well the biggest concern that you hear is specifically from the evangelical uh churches is about this includes the lgbt community it talks about uh different genders special treatment that they, that also that they'll get special treatment mm -hmm. and that we should be guided by the uh constitution which talk which talks about the supremacy of god and everything else that comes along with right. this very common explanation so we hear it and i think that when people hear it they're seeing this as the main obstacle to yeah. the bill so what is being done whether to attempt to get them on board or provide more clarification or what can be done, given the fact that the court has already ruled on this issue? Right, um, and so I think that there's perhaps, I think sexual orientation is clear. Yeah. Um, there may then be um, conversations about some of the protected characteristics, and that's an area that um, we, we are going to have to, to come to, to examine. Um, but I want to jump back to the premise of the question that uh, there is no special treatment. There is that there are, we're talking about humanity and yeah. recognizing the humanity in um, all individuals so that 
um, persons are able to work, that they're able to um, aspire and to dream and to know that when they go into work that that will be on the basis of merit, um, that persons are able to access education fairly. Um, we're not talking about particular rights, we're talking about um, rights that are common to all. Yeah. Um, and where persons are unable to access that, whether that's on the basis of disability or sexual orientation um, or on the basis of sex, that the state has a constitutional, and we're not just talking an international obligation, the state has a constitutional obligation to ensure that citizens have equal protection of the law and the ability um, to benefit from common taxpayers' dollars, um, etc. And how will the bill change the work that you're doing, Enrique? Well, like I said, the, um, we hope that the bill can allow us to, to provide significant impact in the, in the AIDS epidemic. Because like I said, many of the barriers are relating to discrimination. Uh, one of the key uh, things addressed in the bill is the issue of the age of uh, sexual consent and uh, um, accessing medical services. So we hope that um, those can allow us to be able to, to provide better services and for people to be able to access um, HIV um, testing and medical services as well. And what's your timeline, lastly? We are looking to, in the next couple of months, to, to have a, a final bill for us to present to Parliament and we wait from there. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, thank you for coming in and continuing this conversation with us uh, so that we can help to all understand better yeah. what's included in the draft. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks very much for having us. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, it's report card time, but it's good news. Don't worry. We're talking about the reef after the break. Sixty-five years ago, Don Nomario started with one bar and a vision to capture the taste of Belize and share it with the world. Realizing that this vision would not be easy, the Perdomo family pulled together and rose to the challenge. In 1995, they became the first exporters of fine Belizean rum. Sixty-five years later,
back. Joining us for our second conversation all about the reef is Nicole Craig, who is the country coordination for the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People. Morning. Good morning, Nicole, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. So we just got a report card, mm -hmm. as you know, and um, our reef got a pretty good score, right? Relatively speaking. It went up from last time. Yeah. For sure. So yeah. why don't you tell us all about the recent report that's come out and what it's all about? Well, it's quite a report um, mm -hmm. and there's so many sections, so I'm sure we'll touch on each section at some point during this yeah. conversation, but the, I guess, highlight is that Belize's score um, as a country went up from a 2.8 to a 3.0, um, but the report card itself does talk about the Mesoamerican Reef, which mm -hmm. yeah. comprises of four different, sorry, the reef runs along four different countries, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras, and so the score for all countries combined, that 1,000 kilometer stretch, actually went down. So, so the class average went down, right. but we did good. We did good, right. Okay, so let's let's backtrack a bit, right? All right, sure. Because the Mesoamerican Reef, and people really hate hearing that term <laughs> because it means that it's not ours. Mm -hmm. We are in control of the portion that's in front of us. Right. Mexico is in, in charge of the portion in front of them, that little bit they have right. there. Guatemala the same and Honduras right. the same. It goes like that. Right. Um, so really, the largest portion of the reef is, is faring off okay right so what's throwing down our average so the average overall went down because there were decreases in commercial and herbivorous fish seen in honduras so those mm. it, the decrease was large enough to pull down the score for the entire mar because the individual country scores of mexico and guatemala actually didn't change okay so belize went up but that decrease in honduras was significant enough to pull it down yeah how do you grade a reef oh well Th that's a complicated answer um, <laughs> because when you talk about health, health is a word that can, that to define it, you have to include so many things. Okay. We actually have a book on it, okay. <laughs> right? Um, but to put it simply, um, there are so many things you have to think about the people, you have to think about the economy, you have to think about the natural resources on the reef itself. Um, and so in choosing from quite a bunch of different indicators, they're called indicators because the presence or their absence tells you something, whether it's good or bad. And so to decide how, what, what, which, would we, which would we use to define reef health came down to what you could actually measure, came down okay. to what's accessible. Can, can, is this something that I can do again next year? Can I afford to keep doing it? Um, what does high mean? What does low mean? So those are just questions you ask when thinking about what will I use. Yeah. So it came down to four things. It came down to co commercial fish biomass, herbivorous fish biomass, coral cover, and macroalgae cover. So those are the four that we used because of the reasons I stated. So we check out the fish population. Right. See if they're still hanging around. If Pretty they're still much. hanging around, that means that's, that's good. we still have a healthy mm -hmm. enough reef. But yeah. there was an issue with the parrot fish, wasn't there? Well, back in, the, this is the sixth report card. So we've been collecting data for a while. Mm -hmm. So one of the first ones, made the recommendation that we should protect herbivores, parrotfish and other grazers, because of the importance, important role they play on the reef. Mm -hmm. And that actually happened in 2009. Mm -hmm. And so that law made it illegal for anyone to extract, remove in any way parrotfish and, and other grazers. So by having them remain on our reef and being able to grow, the impact they're supposed to have, which is removing all that macroalgae, we're starting to see a difference in the amount of algae that we have, as well as the numbers of parrotfish that we have. And so this report card we're able to show that the biomass of parrotfish and other herbivores that we measure um, fell within the good category for Belize. So we got in the in our in a little pie that shows all the scores well indicators. That one is actually green, so that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah I actually um, was going to ask mm -hmm. about some of the specific characteristics of um, our reef, mm -hmm. which has caused our score to raise. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in comparison to when we have our neighbor um, Honduras having mm -hmm. gone north. So, what are yes. the um, things that came out in the report specifically? Some of the specific characteristics about Belize. Yeah. So for Belize, um, I actually have a graph in some of the images I brought that shows the trend over the past years. Mm -hmm. um, but for Belize, what we are noticing is is that so since 2009 we've seen parrot fish numbers increase so that is a good thing okay. we also saw that coral cover for the entire mar it did go up and for belize it did even if it's just one percent what do you mean by coral cover so um when you're collecting the when we're collecting the data in the field we're literally just running a line on the bottom of the sea um and it's just points, whatever falls here or here or here, we're writing down what we see. And so simply put, 
the amount of times the line that you're running runs on coral versus sponge versus rock, it all adds up and you see what you find the most of. Okay. And so you're looking for a certain number of corals, a certain number of algae. And so um, the thresholds for high coral cover is 40%. Okay. So for Belize, we're still below 20, but um, we are higher than where we used to be. And so that's a good so thing. It's cool. Um, for for now, I will say for now because we actually have a part of the report kind of touches on this coral disease that would impact coral cover. So all the data we collected was before we went out and measured this disease. So um, we would really need to go back and, and do that coral cover assessment again to yeah. see what changed. But from the data that we have here, it shows th that increase. And then we saw a decrease in macroalgae as well, which is a good thing. We're still um, trying other projects to help reduce the amount of macroalgae we see on our reefs, and we can talk about those too. So algae will grow on the coral, mm -hmm. and the herbivores, like the parrotfish, eat the algae. Right. So when that's a healthier population, you have less algae. Is, is that, that kind is, of the correlation? Yeah, that, that is for sure. The, the issue with algae is that um, it's not a bad thing. It actually naturally occurs on reef. The issue is when there's too much. Um, and too much means that it's overgrowing the entire bottom. And when the corals spawn, eventually they need to settle somewhere, s somewhere flat to begin to grow themselves. And so if the entire surface is covered in algae, where will they land? Um, mm. Which means that they're not going to continue reproducing because they have nowhere to, to settle and grow. And so by having all these herbivores, whether it's fish or parrot, sorry, part fish or diadema, the urchins or crabs that help to clear these spaces without those creatures, then we're going to run into that kind of problem, seeing that our reef is not going to continue growing. So let me ask the question, mm -hmm. and I really hope people at home have had their <laughs> breakfast, because I remember previous conversations where the problem we were having with algae mm -hmm. was linked to sewer liquid going into or waterways <laughs> and all the way out to the reef because the yeah. actual bacteria you're finding in this mm -hmm. algae mm -hmm. is from what you deposit in the bathroom. Yeah, so one of the things we highlighted in the report card was that the sewage treatment facilities we have in Belize don't really serve the entire country. Um, and so it means that a large percentage of people use septic tanks um, or don't at all. And so eventually that waste ends up out into the water that nutrients is food it's fuel for algae that's what they thrive on even notice how green a drain gets mm -hmm. it's because all that nutrients is oh in I there know, <laughs> 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 and that nutrient is just giving it life and so apart from that with all this warm water it's just the perfect breeding ground for for all this algae and so now we have a lot lot of lot more algae for the herbivores to to attack and so what we're trying to do is do projects that increase this herbivory action. So um, apart from the legislation that protected the part fish and grazers, um, there are projects going on, Healthy Reefs and other organizations that are trying to help the populations of other herbivores on our reef to help to attack this algae and reduce that yeah. number. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we, we haven't really tackled mm -hmm. the sewage problem in the country. That is right. Or agricultural mm -hmm. runoff as much That's as we right. should. So what you're doing is the opposite, getting more mm -hmm. animals that will mm -hmm. eat it so it doesn't... <laughs> well, we still hope that that will be addressed, and it's still something that, I mean, even at the report card launch, it came up, and it's a big discussion. It's something mm -hmm. that we're all pushing to see happen. But in the meantime, there are many things that we're trying to do to help yeah. manage it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And are there any... Um, major concerns that are also coming onto the report, like looking forward, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of questions um, mm -hmm. that are going on in terms of um, things relating to development, climate change. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, in recent years, we've had some concerns with things like um, invasive species, uh, mm -hmm. as well as things like sargassum as well. So are mm -hmm. we looking at ways to um, continue um, scoring well and maintaining the health of the reef looking forward as well? Oh, for sure. There are so many efforts, and um, one of the one of the things that we noticed um, each report card has a recommendation section. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the sixth one, and so some of the recommendations are indeed repeating themselves because change does take time. But the yeah. ones that have been addressed have mm -hmm. made a positive impact. So the things that we flagged this time were um, like enforcement, for example, understanding that Belize has a lot of good laws already. We've thought a lot about protecting our coast, our mangroves, our fisheries, but it comes down to making people comply. It comes yeah. down to making sure that, you know, we have the manpower on the ground to see that people, observe people to see what they're doing. Um, and so that's one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, that we're working on. How can we 
continue to respond to this um, and I guess encouraging compliance because at the end of the day um, it does cost a lot of money to have people out there observing and, and arresting but if we can get people to decide for themselves yeah. I will not break the law I will I will keep the law because I understand what this means that is a big step in the right direction for us yeah. um, in terms of development like you're saying yes that was a, another topic that we brought up um, and it comes down to again the laws we, we I learned recently um, that clearing of mangroves, there should actually be a sign mm -hmm. above an area where there is any kind of development happening. And so if people become aware of things like this, then of ourselves, we can be the ones to notice that this should not be happening. Yeah. I, I should say something. So it's it, apart from, you know, holding the uh, respectable departments um, okay. accountable, people, we should also be informed and be a part of that accountability yeah. as well. Are there portions of the reef that are doing, um, that are perhaps behind or, or not performing as well? Um, there are, so yes, the results show um, very different, I guess we have subregions within the country, six subregions. And so the southern barrier, for example, did well with the parrot fish. Um, the central barrier also looked pretty good. But there's some areas like you're suggesting that didn't do as well and that would have been like the northern area of the northern barrier which is like Bacalar Chico around San Pedro um, we didn't see um, as high coral scores there and um, we what's that, what's impacting them there well I would feel that we do we we wanted to collect more information as well but what we collected shows that um, the the coral cover in that area is much lower it could be due to development. There's a lot of development happening in that area. Yeah. Um, high traffic, high too. traffic too. There's a lot of tourists in that area. People ask me all the time, you know, sun, this sunscreen this bad for the I reef, was, I right? Was gonna ask yeah, you. If people ask me, is sunscreen bad for the reef? And there are some yeah. um, types of sunscreen that they've been advised not to use because of the chemicals that it contains. Yeah. And I know personally, when going to the reef, I try my best to wear long sleeve, the buff over my face, long pants, so that I don't have to use it and that I don't add yeah. to that one person. Um, we always think of ourselves as an individual. What I'm wearing, I can't, it can't be that bad. It's just me. But there's hundreds of people visiting this, yeah. these places every day um, throughout the year. And so eventually that all adds up. So we have to think about how that individual contribution combined with everybody else's yeah. makes that bigger impact. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's, it's an uh, sorry, especially important conversation to have is considering um, what the reef represents for Correct. Belize yeah. in terms of you know, our national development. It's mm -hmm. probably our biggest tourist attraction. Mm, yeah. But the healthier it is, the more people want to come to see it. Exactly. And the more yeah. people that come to see it, is bring, they bring more problems. Exactly. So how do we find that balance? <laughs> wow, that, that is the question. <laughs> that yeah. is the question. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you want to make money, but you also want to make sure you protect your resource. Yeah. Um, there are so many ideas and discussions that have been happening about this, especially when it came to the, to the um, disease. You know, this is not what's happening. But we did ask, like, do we need to close the area? You know, there's so many questions as to, like, what the impact of people being in an area like that would would mean so it's 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 a it's an ongoing discussion as to the best way to manage these things but i know that um if there comes a point where they feel that caps are necessary i'm sure they'll be put in place yeah because yeah. They're, they're controllable factors right. and and lesser controllable exactly factors. and that's very controllable um yeah. it, my, my concern is looking at uh, what you mentioned about Honduras right. because the reef is a living thing Correct. you know it's, it's not that we we have a, a end at the end of Belize mm -hmm. where one Guadal well I mean it does start in one area <laughs> but it's not a definitive break in the reef so what happens in Honduras has implications for us as well sure. what is the type of um, accountability by the different countries that support this project and the protection of the Mesoamerican reef in being able to do their part. Because if, mm -hmm. you know, Belize is, this is a group project. Mm -hmm. Belize is doing all the work. We're getting yeah. our numbers up. Mm -hmm. um, the others have kind of kept steady, mm -hmm. but then you have one that's falling short. How, what type of support mechanisms, what type of accountability, mm -hmm. so that their um, misbehavior or perhaps lack of adequate um, whatever action or, mm -hmm. um, doesn't implicate the rest of the reef. 
Well, um, that comes down to like exactly what Healthy Reefs is doing. So Healthy Reefs is actually not just me. Um, I am just one yeah. representative from Belize, but we actually have someone just like me in every country, in Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. Mm. And so the Healthy Reefs team actually works really hard to be involved in every way that we can whenever we see something that needs our intervention. And we don't do it alone. It's, in fact, it's actually an initiative that's made up of over 70 organizations in these four countries. Okay. And so we meet regularly to mm -hmm. talk about the issues in our countries, the ones that we have in common and where they overlap and what we can do, what we can push, what we can fight for. And so this is a collaborative effort in general mm -hmm. involving a lot of organizations even the fisheries department is a part of this because it's something that absolutely needs their support mm -hmm. and they have been very supportive mm -hmm. and so I think that because of this collaboration this collaborative spirit it allows us to get into places somebody knows somebody somebody has been there before and it gives us that that access that network to be able to make change or at least fight really hard for it yeah. um, so that's a very good thing that we have established with this network yeah. And I think if you remember from your school days, <laughs> getting the passing mark is, takes effort. Right. Keeping the passing mark takes even more. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what is currently taking place? I mean, you mentioned things like we know overfishing, we know mm -hmm. the fisheries regulations. These are all things that are ongoing, um, right. uh, uh, part of an ongoing process in trying mm -hmm. to, to mitigate those do you have things like the coral disease? We know climate change mm -hmm. is still an issue. Right. What's happening on the ground to ensure that we can still keep our reef healthy, or portion of the reef yeah. healthy? Well, like you mentioned, the fisheries bill, that is, that is absolutely important yeah. um, for to see the sustainability of our fisheries. And another thing, um, the constant push to increase our protected areas and replenishment zones. Um, there's a lot that's being done we, and rec that we recognize needs to be done, yeah. but there's a lot of groundwork that's happened to make these things possible. So for example, um, replenishment zones, I know that there is a process involved um, to expand the amount of replenishment zones that we already have in place. Belize has been working hard to meet certain targets that we've signed in, in commitments, and we've actually been doing pretty good. And so these replenishment zones essentially are like safe havens mm. for our marine animals. And so they serve as like a bank of, I guess, fish. So whenever they're in this place, you cannot move them, you cannot catch them, um, and they're allowed to reproduce freely mm -hmm. and serve as, I guess, where the repopulation of the external areas would come from. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're trying to extract from the general use areas, that supply by, by connection should come from these replenishment zones, and more of them we have, it increases our odds of keeping that, sustaining that fishery. Yeah. And so we're trying to have these little havens, these little pockets all over the country to ensure we can keep that going. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and so even though there's much more work to be done, it's really important to highlight the things that we did right yeah. and that we are doing right because Belize actually is, I guess a world leader in yeah. the amount of positive things we've been doing to protect our reefs and, and it's been showing the changes are showing we I mean we got to because I think Gavin said it very clearly it's probably the main attraction as to why mm -hmm. people come to Belize and tourism is mm -hmm. our number one revenue mm -hmm. earner in this country it so it's not just about environmentalists who are out there trying to make sure the reef stays alive and mm -hmm. pretty it's mm -hmm. about how we're able to run the country yeah Correct. and I think um, we also have to remember that one, the reef is a living thing, it is. and it's also an ecosystem in and of itself in that yeah. it supports all different types of marine life. Yeah. So I don't know, perhaps for our viewers, you can tr tr talk a bit um, mm -hmm. to try to underscore the importance of what the reef is and what it represents um, for us. Oh, wow, that's a paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> that's a paragraph. But so we got the TV version. <laughs> yeah. That's a paragraph. But essentially, um, the reef serves many purposes for our country. We can mm -hmm. talk about as a physical barrier for storms. It yes. definitely protects our coast. And the reef itself works in association with other ecosystems like mangroves and sea grasses. So when we keep all of that intact, we know that the next tsunami warning that we get, we always say, oh, the reef on Brooklyn Top, man. But if we don't have a reef, then what? Yeah. You know, so we, we don't want to take it for granted because we understand that important service that it provides for us. It also gives us food. Um, we know that many people's livelihood depend on being able to fish and sell this for income. And so if we think about all the different services it gives us in all these different areas, then I, it should like instill in us that we need to protect it for various reasons, for mm -hmm. selfish reasons, because we like eating fish, mm. for our economy, because we know we want our country to thrive. Yeah. And of course, because of our own safety, having this reef and mangrove system that will protect us in
the event of a storm. Which is our barrier. Right. <laughs> and <in> barrier <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, of course, we appreciate you coming in and telling us all about how we're doing. Um, but most importantly, that we don't lose sight of the fact that the work continues. It does. Um, and individually, we have our parts to play as well. We do. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about the Rising Stars Sports Development Program. So please stay tuned. What makes our team different from the other? From the
about the Rising Star Sports Development Program. Joining us to talk about the program are um, the founder and coordinator of the program, who is Aldo Manzanero. We also have some PUE coordinator, uh, we have, uh, sorry, uh, the PUE coordinator with the program, Gillian Lam. And we also have uh, Tyrone Rodriguez, who is a PUE coach from the program as well. So good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So, um, Aldo, perhaps you can start us off by discussing a bit about uh, the founding of the program, what it's all about, and what um, are the goals um, that you went into when you started? Um, the program started in 2008. It was um, founded as a development program, <clears throat> basically, um, with a core of sports, um, sports development. And we have since basically kind of gravitated towards basketball. It's, um, it's the sport that we're most familiar with, well, I was. Um, and like mentioned before, we, we really try to incorporate other sports as well. So um, we do, we have four pillars um, in the program. The one is, the first one is the PV program, which um, has kids from five to 12. <clears throat> we have the male program, which, which takes over basically 12 to adult. And then there's a female program. Um, and then we now have a mentorship and sponsorship program. So those four pillars. Nice. So but what made you want to start this up in Balmapan? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting story. Well, it does have a backstory, but um, noting that Belpan has, um, is the center of Belize, it's supposed to be the capital, yeah. but at that time it didn't have much in regards to offering kids um, options. Yeah. Um, before, you, well, well, UB has developed now, but um, initially there, there wasn't a, a young, a child program. Um, there wasn't, now they have um, Mandalito football, PB, um volleyball, but at that time it didn't have one. And basketball is one of the, what we consider one of the, the pillar sports because it tends to have high risk children gravitate towards it. Mm. Um, for some reason, um, it does have a culture that draws them in. Yeah. So we saw it as a good way to, to basically join kids and start to have them basically interact with coaches, um, develop some fundamentals, um, incorporate some social skills. Uh, and that has been very beneficial for us. Yeah. And since the start, how many kids did you start with? Started with twelve, yeah. But that was with the the, the teenage program. Now we have had throughout the program, throughout the twelve years, we have had over two hundred kids. Um, right now we have about twenty four in the male program. We have about eight in the female program, and the PVs are between twenty and twenty five. Um, it some some weeks it grows, but usually we have about twenty strong. Yeah. I, I love that you have the little kids involved. Can we talk about that? Because, you know, two things that you said. One, you're trying to get children away from any other activity that they shouldn't be doing, even if it's just idle time. And sports is well known to help children develop and to have a positive outlet for whatever emotions they're going through. Usually we see it for the adolescent children and the teenagers, but you guys are going as low as five years old? Yes, ma'am. Wow. So, Janine, tell us about that recruitment effort. Jillian, sorry. Um, well, sometimes we see the children with their... Sometimes we see um, children with their parents or whatever just shooting ball at the court. And so we'll just ask if they're, like, interested in, like, coming with us. Mm -hmm. And I... It's a, it's a wonderful experience for them. Yeah. And... Um, to recruit, I mean, every everybody is invited. Yeah. Female and male. I like that. Female too. and male. So you have females for all groups. We have females for all groups. Yes, we have the PVs, and then um, the girls team, which um, participates in several tournaments outside of Belize. Mm. Yes, and then the male team, the male senior team, the PVs compete outside as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've been invited to go to Puerto Rico, Colombia. Um, we have we have um, Costa Rica, yeah. So we have been uh, the, the the program has gotten a lot of interest outside of Belize, yeah. But we've not really, you know, set set of solid foot down in Belize as yet. So yeah, we're trying you to need go. a you need a Belize City PV team so you guys can compete yes. against. We'll see which city really rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tyrone is like I mean, yeah. you know, buttered. <laughs> Tyrone, tell me about working with kids at that age. Um, I like to work with them because they're like. 
they're energetic and they're always willing to learn. And um, one thing I want to say is that from the start, the kids that we had weren't, they weren't as structured as they are now. Yeah. And every week they come, they are excited to learn new things. And I guess they're, they're excited ready. to just be there. Mm -hmm. to, to be with be kids there. their age and to be able to have fun and to play mm -hmm. I mean that's all they love doing at that <laughs> age <laughs> but you work on foundation skills right I'd imagine because what I hear from you is that yes it's 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 one of those activities that you can get children involved in but you're taking the sport seriously yeah. in, in teaching some of the fundamentals yeah we try to use the word when you discuss it afterwards, the word <laughs> fundamentals, because okay. trying to make it as fun as possible, because at that age, you're, you're trying to teach um, hand eye coordination, body coordination, you're trying to teach them discipline, um, team team, teamwork, sportsmanship. Yeah. So, all the drills that we run or all the programs that we run, we try to incorporate that in some way. So, usually we run some type of game, dodgeball, sometimes different, different forms of catch with a basketball. We teach fundamentals, which, like you said, doesn't hold them that long. Mm -hmm. So you have to sprinkle it in as much as possible and try to make them learn the fundamentals while they think they're doing something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The rules yeah. of the game, which is, is something that even older, older players tend to struggle with, we try to teach them the rules. Uh, and more likely, more than everything else, we try to give them some type of family. Mm -hmm. um, we, we preach that at, within the, the coaches and within the organization. It's, it's a family structure. So mm -hmm. the bridge is what's important to us, going from PV to junior to senior, and hopefully one day to a pro player. Mm -hmm. we, we, that's the important thing for us. So the, the more fundamentals we give them at a younger age, the higher, the better they are, the higher the trajectory. Because mm -hmm. Belize has more talent, and, and speaking with other coaches from other countries that come to Belize or that we visited, Belize has tons of talent. Mm -hmm. But it's just not putting them in that right path, yeah. and that's what we struggle with. So that's but what starting we starting on the right leg. Which, yeah. yeah, yes, because you know you have we we have coaches that want to win, mm -hmm. and and that's always a priority. And then there are coaches that want to teach. So our program we try to teach as much as possible. So the the competitive nature is there, but the idea is that instead of maybe having a, a highest trajectory of a university scholarship, maybe it's an outside university mm -hmm. university yeah. or a pro career. So we have long-term goals in that regard. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to ask because that is one of the focuses of the program in terms of actually um, preparing um, you know, those with the talent or whatever to actually be able to be in a position to you know, actually pursue um, a, you know, perhaps a career or some type of um, future in sports. Um, going back to what Marlene said, a big part of the program is trying to quote unquote take uh, the sport seriously. Yes. Um, so, how have you found over the years um, the reaction to that has been? You know, have you found that there's enthusiasm among the um, people who are in the program to actually want to pursue them at, on a higher level? Um, you mean about outside mm -hmm. like scouts? Yes, we've had people offer um, scholarships to females in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, as well as males. Um, we have we have one of the highest um, tertiary school scholarship recipients of any program. I think right now we're at about 25 percent. Oh so wow. one, out, one out of every four kids that participates in the Trojan program will somehow get some scholarship or some or in some university incentive. So um, we have had, and we we don't boast about it, but we do have several um, NBL players that came from our program that have somehow been at, in our program at some point. And if you count teams, we count about it. Most teams, it's at least three out of every 12 or three out of four out of every 12 has been in the children program. And it's only been active for about 12 years. So That's a we, significant we, number. Yeah, it is a significant those number. Are yeah, I was going to say, those are impressive markers. And, you know, it, it's one of the things we see all the time. And we hear people say, it. we have talent, we have talent, we have natural raw talent. We go outside of Belize and people are impressed. But any good program has to start from before you even dribble the ball. Like you have to learn how, you have to learn um, how to do it properly, how to have the right sportsmanship. What, what, how do you keep that, the focus on the fundamentals? Because you said it very clearly before, there are some programs that may be all about winning, but what you want is that you, you build athletes. Um, how do you keep that focus? Because I'm sure by the time they reach like the U90 and they don't want to talk anymore about sportsmanship or, <laughs> or proper uh, fundamentals, they want to win. That's true, but we have to, we, 
um, as, a, as a country and as, as sports coordinators have to realize that there's always a higher goal. Yeah. And that's the reason why the program tries to travel as much as possible. Mm -hmm. We try to participate in different countries. We, we participate twice a year in two tournaments in Guatemala. We do the same thing in, in Mexico, in yeah. Cancun and Bacalar and Chetumal because there is, more, there is a culture more to detail in those countries mm. in regards to how the game is prepared, how you prepare for the game, um, the fundamentals, like we say, much, the children learn at a much younger age. So when they go across and they compete in these very organized teams, they want to be that way. Yeah. You know, they, want, they, they see that and they want to, they know they, we, we have, a, we have a, a sports culture and believes that it's very individual. Everybody wants to be the star. Everybody wants to be the star. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. But there's there's a there's a goal to having team success. Yeah. And 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 we we have we have um, throughout the years we've we've been blessed because mm -hmm. we have we have great kids. Um, mm -hmm. We we recruit Very really true. great kids. Great kids gravitate to the program because yeah. sometimes we travel and there's a kid that's less fortunate, and um, maybe you know you guys want to go to Burger King, but mm -hmm. they'll they'll be willing to buy somewhere else or they'll be willing to pick. You go from their pockets and you know allow that child to travel with them. Oh, wow. right. So we 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 believe that the culture and the family has had a large influence on them. Mm -hmm. And even now we have guys that were with us in 2008 that still come back to the program. Mm -hmm. When they travel, they'll still come and travel with us, or they offer their services. Um, they offer to be mentors to children and sponsors to children. So we try to keep it close knit, and um, we're hoping that they could be duplicated in other communities as well. So walk us through. You have Pee Wee teams, yes, male and female, and then tell us the, the other the other groups that you have. We have Pee Wee, which is from five to twelve, but that's coed. Uh huh. Um, it's it's treated as coed throughout the world. Okay. So up to that age, both. So um, the girls and boys play together, play together right? yeah. in the Pee Wee team. Yeah, the guys the guys got beat up by some girls last night. Oh time, my! So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, oh. No, 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 they they, they won't like that. They won't like that. <laughs> Motivation, but no. Um, yeah, you go to twelve. And then from there, we have the, the male program that goes from 12 to 17, and then 17 to adult. But when we travel, we always take the juniors with us. Mm -hmm. So our team will take up maybe six seniors and maybe six juniors, because it's about experience. Yeah. And so the peewees go out too? The peewees go out too, yes. Oh, well that the must be so cute. Yes, you know, <laughs> they, yeah. trust me, they, they're loved. We're yes. loved. Yeah. <laughs> because the Belize has a very different culture and people gravitate to it. Yeah. And then we have the females. The females go from 12 to adult. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had as much participation and mm -hmm. yeah. as success with the females, but that's one of our goals is to try to incorporate more females. So yeah. that's the reason we're on the show to try and recruit. We have kids come up to us all the time, but there's a different culture with females in sports than yeah. with males. And, and we try our best to bridge that gap. So yeah. we reach out to parents. If parents want to come to practice, we allow them. And you know, if they want to travel with us, they can travel with us. Yeah. You know, and, and the girls try to offer as much mentorship as they can. Mm -hmm. So even when the girls have problems, sometimes they won't tell their parents, but they'll tell us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have that a lot, actually. What's the level of community support you guys have in Bamapan? Wow. <laughs> we, it, is, it, is, it does take a, a, a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And, and we believe that we have great community support. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's, it's a very expensive en endeavor to have these four programs and traveling every weekend, because we travel every weekend. So it's very expensive, but sometimes people just come up to us and say, you know, we love what you're doing, you know, I, I just got paid, take this. Or, mm -hmm. or sometimes, like, we have a story that um, the guys were practicing and had some old basketballs, and someone just bought a new one and said, let's switch. Oh. So we, we have great support from parents, we have some parents that we call them the backbone because yeah. they, they'll come and they'll, they'll discuss. And sometimes, like I said, even with problems, home problems, school problems, we try to assist as much as possible. So it doesn't end at the basketball court. Yeah. But how, how do you fund yourselves? Well, that's a good story. Um, no, <laughs> we, we do fundraisings. Um, okay. It comes a lot from some of the coaches on the past participants' pockets. We have, short years, have several um, sponsors. You know, um, we offer a program to anyone that's a small business that wants to be a sponsor that they can basically just give us traveling shirts and put their logos at the back mm -hmm. but and it's funny because the, we build up a few of those yeah. uh, once uh, at one point I was just wearing Trojan shirts all over the place mm -hmm. so I was always told about it but we do have a, a, a great list of sponsors and if you want yeah. touch base on those okay well um, we have one from CGI um, Magnab Designs Tropicare uh, Wingstop, Surf and Turf, um, 
Atlantic Bank Social Security. Um, also, Mayor Belial and Jal Jan Saldivar. Um, DFC, BNE, Oceana, um, Vegas Distributors. Um, of course, the people of Belmopan, they yeah. really help a lot. Um, Allen Construction and West Track. Mm -hmm. yeah, they've, they've, we've had people chip in, and, and we can't complain. We know yeah. it's hard. Mm -hmm. And in Belmopan, it's a very small business community. Yeah. So when they take small business take from their pockets and sometimes they visit the program and say we want to help, yeah. we can help, we try, you know, we try to work with them as much as possible. So what about uh, developing a sister group in other parts of the country? We especially the Pee Wee, because we have quite a few of the, the teenage <laughs> basketball groups, but the Pee Wees I don't think we do. No, we've we've been we've people have reached out to us in, in other communities. But um, it's kind of hard to, to move around. Yeah. Um, what we what we we've tried to preach is doing it the right way. Yeah. So um, we have like we have a we have we have a lot of experience in it. We have a template. Um, but we reach out to anyone that's interested. Um, and we tell everyone that you don't have to be a basketball professional, mm -hmm. a pass player at that age. If you're teaching the right fundamentals and and you and you um, and you interact with the children at a certain point, you will get good results. Um, so, like I said, we, we, we are open to having people contact us mm -hmm. to help, but we would love, it's, it's, our, it's our dream to have a PV program that we can go to Orange Rock, Corozal, yeah. BG. Uh, we've, we've mostly had to play amongst ourselves mm -hmm. in tournaments um, it locally, but if there is someone that's willing, we are more than willing to try and assist in any way. Mm. What's it like the coaching the, uh, the kids in a tournament, in a game? Are they very competitive? <laughs> they're competitive and they're all of them want to be in the game. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah, pick me, sir, pick me. Pick me, yeah. pick me. I know all the time. Yeah, and, it's, and like, do they also, like, even though they have that, do they still like respond well to like the structures and the rules and stuff that you try to enforce as well? Yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes they have some that they don't quite understand what we're trying to do and we have to break it down to them so that they yeah. can see that it's not only it's not only to be about them, it's about everyone. It's not for one person. There's mm -hmm. no I in team. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's how we deal with that. That has got to be an interesting experience. You probably have a deep bench and have to use the <laughs> whole thing too, right? <laughs> 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 So what would you say, um, you know, you're here, you're talking about what you are, you, you have this development program going, clearly you have the support in Belmopan, um, but you're looking for more girls and you're hoping that other agencies will get in touch or basketball fans will get in touch and maybe partner and start their own groups? Yeah, we have, we have two, um, well, the, the funding is needed for two things, one, the operation of the program. Yeah. And uh, we have always looked for a main sponsor. Yeah. Um, other programs in different communities have like one main sponsor. Yeah. And then smaller, it's always easier, because then we can we there's a there's a consistent source of funding. And then the the next one is the mentorship program. Mm -hmm. um, this year we started a mentorship program that takes basically it's just a contributor program. Yeah. So um, we ask eight eight people to contribute throughout the year, and they, they sponsor a child but they also mentor that child. So we have group activities that they would come to, the children get to interact, and it's extremely important because in Belize right now, we're looking for positive male role models as well as females. Yeah. And sometimes at basketball courts or where kids normally would hang out, mm -hmm. those people don't normally, aren't, aren't, aren't normally at. Yeah. So it's extremely important that we put them in situations that they interact with these people. Yeah. People that have ha gotten scholarships for basketball, have gotten their master's degree because they've been involved with basketball. Um, people that have businesses that are entrepreneurs, and, and the kids really and truly try to learn it yeah. as, as much as possible. They, they, and it's, it's been, it's been a, a, an open experience because, like you said, sometimes it, it seems hard that a kid would, you know, calm down for five minutes to be <laughs> taught something, but when, when they see that it's, it benefits them, and then when you, you, we show them videos that sometimes we show them videos, LeBron does it, you know, <laughs> Kyrie does it. It's not just you that have to do it, it's everyone. So it, it's very, very interesting for us. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for coming in. How do people find out more about your program or maybe check out one of your games that you're having? Um, you could contact us at, um, my number is 622-8323. Um, you could message or you can, um, you can call. Um, there's Jillian. 
your number? Oh, well, um, my number is 628-1405. Mm -hmm. uh, um, right. You can always contact us. We're always Are you on Facebook? Do you have a Facebook page or a website? We don't have a Facebook page. We, we're, we're <laughs> trying to develop a Facebook page. Okay, so that's your next task. That's so people can, can see these cute videos of the kids playing <laughs> basketball. <laughs> Um, and, and I keep on emphasizing that it's cute just because of the age, but mm -hmm. what they're learning are invaluable skills as well. And so uh, definitely keep up the great work. Thank, Thank you. you for coming in and telling us all about it, and best of luck. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. us. All right, we're going to go ahead and take our final break, and when we come back, we'll have our wrap-up, so stay tuned. With over 100 years of service excellence in Belize, the Belize Bank Limited recognizes the importance of leading the way yes, as we the, um, enter into this fast-growing, big world. Yeah. Our Belize Bank mobile banking app virtually places a number of banking capabilities in the palm of our customers' hands, anytime, anywhere, through the use of their Android or iOS devices. The Belize Bank, delivering a convenient and enhanced banking experience to meet the demands of our customers' digital lifestyle. The Belize Bank, our country, your bank. As one of the largest cable and internet providers in Belize, CBC strives to provide our customers with the highest standards of quality, value, and service in all aspects of cable TV and internet. Monitoring our systems closely, our technicians combine up another fun show. Um, I 
was really interested in the conversation just now. I always like when initiatives um, involve, you know, really young children, especially in something like sports. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the time, you know, if we compare ourselves to other countries, they're starting their trainings from, you know, four or five years old in whatever sport it is. Yeah. So it's really encouraging to see a program like that. So I'm really, um, you know, encouraged and enthused after having that last conversation that, that there's such an initiative going on. And I hope it spreads to the rest of the country. I do too. I mean, I, I think it's wonderful. And I'm sure in Bamopan, um, having a children's program, because we, we think with Belicity and there are a bit uh, that people can access, but they started to fill that gap. But I do, like you, love when they start with the little ones, because that is that is the secret ingredient we've been lacking for many, many years. Mm -hmm. You can't, when you meet them at 10, 12, 15, and you have to undo all oh, the yeah. bad practices, it takes, takes more time, rather than them just growing up knowing how, it's, how the game is supposed to be played and how you're supposed to uh, play best your sport. And it's the same with singing. Yeah. and dancing yeah. and, and all these other things. The younger you start, the better trained you are. Yeah, and I think it's also important um, in specifically what they're doing is that they're also building the whole uh, idea of teamwork and yeah. the rapport among um, others, um, which even if you're talented, you know, in whatever sport you are, you also have to learn how to work with other people, how to harness um, your ability um, and think about a group rather than just yourself. Yeah. So it's um, really great. And I also like that they're also traveling, that they're um, exposing people from very young ages to what people are doing in other countries and giving them opportunities, you know, to, per to pursue it on a higher level. Um, and they have girls playing. Yeah. Because girls play sports too. Yep. Mm. <laughs> News flash. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think definitely a great program and a great way to close off the show. I mean, we started talking, uh, starting, we started the show talking about the Equal Opportunities Bill and uh, this other consultation phase that they're going through. Um, they came in, they clarified some of the points. Uh, I'm, they seem to have a few more months to go before they finalize the actual draft that will be submitted. Um, but we're grateful for the update to find out more. And then uh, talking about the reef yeah. and uh, the report card that we got there, clearly still some work has to be done, but at least for this year, we can say we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, and I do like um, that it's a regional report and that in particular Belize has done pretty well. Um, so that was super encouraging to hear because, you know, as we were talking about during the segment, the reef is you know, of critical importance yeah. to our country for so many reasons. Mm. Safety, um, tourism, just supporting, you know, Belize's natural um, habitat because everything is interrelated. I mean, yeah. the reef supports so much um, marine life. Yeah. It's a habitat, it's a nesting ground, it's a breeding ground. Um, so many, you know, fish, um, mammals, everything. Um, and of course, there's um, sustaining the healthy population of fish for our fisheries as well. So it's good to learn that what we're doing is working on some level. Um, but of course, there does, as you said, need to be more work done. But I am I feel uh, pretty encouraged after um, that conversation this morning. Yeah, yeah, we can't drop the ball though, mm -hmm. because you are absolutely right. It's about, um, you know, a big part of our, of our tourism product and, and that is an important part of our economy. Also look at the jobs that are tied to it. And really, I mean, on a personal level, it's one of my favorite bragging notes. You know, we got the largest living, living. <laughs> uh, uh, reef in the world. And, you know, my Australian friends don't like to hear that, but it's a fact. Yep. And so, you know, we, we do want to continue to have um, this, this site that we are so proud of um, and that we all are so proud of as Belizeans and do our part as well. Yep. But Gavin, we are completely out of time. Things are getting ready uh, at the Constitution Park in Belize City. As we opened the show, we talked about the fact that the National Trade Union Congress of Belize, which is the umbrella organization for unions, is having a protest today. Uh, only the people can save the people. That's the theme that they're marching under. And they have six demands against um, against corruption that they are holding government accountable to, uh, that you cannot, or that they do not want the elections to be called until these demands are met. We're gonna have full updates from what's happening here in Belize City uh, throughout the course of, of the day, and we're gonna have it live on Facebook and also on the channel as well, on Channel 5. So 
uh, stay tuned. Definitely do that. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, close it off now. So remember, if you want to contact us, send us an email at oye at channel5belize.com. Drop me a line at marlene underscore oye at channel5belize.com. Find us on Facebook at Open Your Eyes Easy. Or on Instagram at OIE Belize. And remember to tune in tomorrow morning at 6.30 when you open your eyes. And start your morning right. Until then, keep your eyes, your mind. And your heart open. We'll see you soon. Enjoy your day, Belize. Open Your Eyes was brought to you by the Belize Bank, our country, your bank.